many years ago at a homecoming uh, service very similar to this, and if I've got the date right, uh, this was our last homecoming uh, before we went to two services. I preached this in 2007. And so uh, homecoming can be hundreds of different ideas, but along the lines that we've heard through the songs uh, today, we're going to be looking at the fact that uh, this is what we want anyone and everyone that's ever been a part of Bethel that wants to come back, we want them to do this. We want them to come home. Uh, if you've got a son, daughter, mom, dad uh, that had a relationship with Christ and now they no longer have that, you want them to come home. Uh, and this passage talks about the prodigal coming home, uh, if you will, uh, to dad after they have left. Let's just dive in. Let's stand for the reading and reverence of God's holy word. Luke chapter 15. We're going to start in verse 8. Actually, I think we're going to start in verse 1. Then all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him to hear him, and the Pharisees and scribes complained, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. Aren't you glad of that? Jesus receives sinners and eats with them. That means that he'll dine with you. That's what that means, because we're all sinners. He eats with sinners, and he dines with them. So he spoke this parable to them, saying, what man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine just persons who need no repentance. And can you think? Is there even one person on this planet besides Christ that doesn't need repentance? No, every one of us needs repentance. Look at verse 8. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls her friends and neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I lost. <coughs> Likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And then he said, a certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal or riotous living. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself <coughs> excuse me, to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into the fields to feed swine. Now, there's two things already that you need to know about the Jewish culture, that it was completely acceptable, even though it was scandalous, for a younger child to ask for his inheritance before his father has died, because basically he was saying, I wish you were dead, so that I could get my money and, and move on and do what I want to do. It, it was, it did happen, and in this case, it certainly happened. But then also, it was absolute scandal to feed swine because pigs were not in the Jewish diet, and it was seen below their uh, dignity, if you will. Look at verse 16. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, see, he had already rehearsed this. I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, and am no longer worthy to be called your son. But notice here, the father interrupts him said to his servants, Bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. And bring the fatted calf here and kill it. And let us eat and be merry. For this was my son who is dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. Now his older son was in the field. And as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. 
And he said to him, your brother has come, and because he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf. But he was angry and would not go in. Therefore his father came out and pleaded with him. So he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I have been serving you. I never transgressed your commandment at any time, and yet you never gave me a younger goat that I may might that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this son of yours came, who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fatted calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that I have is yours. It was right that we should make merry and be glad, for your brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. Father, we ask you to help us to make the Great Commission great in our lives to make it great in this church, to make it great in the association that this church is a part of. I pray, Father, for a revival starting in me for lost souls and for saved souls who have wandered to come back. And I pray, Father, that every time they come back, it won't be a scolding, but we'll make merry. In Jesus' precious and holy name we ask it. Amen. You may be seated. It's a lengthy passage. You, you might not think that we were already pressed for time that we'd read that, but remember, God's Word is more important than anything I'm going to say about God's Word. And the Bible says that God's Word will not return unto Him void. And so I always want to give His Word the opportunity to work. And we see here... Three acts, if you will. Act one, the obedient soul winner. That was the first part of the passage. Act two, the lost soul. Act three, the disobedient soul winner. And when you open this, it's just simply put, act one, the obedient soul winner. Well, what is the action? What is the action of the soul winner? Verse four and eight, they diligently go after That which was lost. You've heard me say in our Bethel approach that it is our responsibility to see ourselves as self-support missionaries to reach the lost of Franklin County. That is the leadership of this church's uh, intention and uh, what would the word be? Attempt at helping all of us get on the same page that we are to have this action. You and I are to be looking for lost souls. Now, I'm going to use a negative experience to teach what hopefully will become positive. Years and years ago, we had a missionary effort, and I knew we were in trouble when the missionary said, Brother Ben, we've got a few people coming, but I I want to warn you, they're lost. I'm like, That's who we're looking for. Praise God, you've got some lost people coming to church. That's what we're supposed to be doing. Now, watch this. I don't believe in 2021 it's any longer, if you will, uh, apropos for you and I to assume, believe, or expect lost people to flock in here to see what we're doing. I, I think those days are gone. Okay? I think you could probably argue they left when the bowling alley became popular and such of that nature. Now there's Netflix and HBO Max. and They're not, as a general rule, please don't get me wrong, I'm not saying it can't happen. I'm saying the days of it happening normally and regularly are probably gone. And so as you work throughout your everyday normal life and you come across those lost souls that are hurting You need to be looking for the lost soul. You need to be looking for that which is lost. And you will be going into their living room. You will be going into their garages. You will be going to their ball games, seeking them. And sooner or later, you may already have them one to Christ. Sooner or later, they'll come with you to church. I think that's probably more likely to happen now than them just wandering in here seeing what we're doing. And now if that happens and when it happens, we praise God for it. 
but we, church, you know, for 20 some odd years, I told you that if they walk through those doors, we're obligated to love them. And about four or five years ago, I started telling you, we're obligated to walk out there and get them too. A amen. And so the action, the action of the soul winner, look here at B, the attitude of the soul winner. We need to rejoice when someone starts being acceptable to the gospel. We need to start rejoicing when they come to Christ. We need to rejoice. We need to have a high old time, if you will. Look at the altitude of praise in verse 7 and 10. The word of God promises you and I that when someone comes to Christ, there is celebration in heaven. And, and when I was a kid, I always assumed it was the angels celebrating. It says in the presence of the angels. It's Jesus having a hallelujah hoedown in front of the angels. Now, doesn't that make sense? He's the one that gave it all. He's the one that died on the cross for their sins. It makes all the sense in the world that he would be the one having a hallelujah fit when someone comes to Christ. Now, look at Act 2, the lost soul. So you've got the declaration of the lost soul. Uh, look there at verse 12 again. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. Now, you know, the word of God uh, is not the most descriptive book, but it does tell you what you need to know. And so even though it doesn't go into all the drama that is there, it tells you exactly what has happened. This young man has come to his dad and said, Dad, I know how our customs work. As a general rule, I'm supposed to wait for you to die. I'm not willing to do that. I know that if I ask it, you will give me my portion. I'm asking. And he gives it to him. He, he liquefies some of his assets, and he gives that younger son. Now, and we can sit here and, and uh, uh, well, bemoan this, but the reality is that in Jewish customs, the oldest son or daughter got the lion's share, uh, two-thirds, and then everybody else had to divide the rest, and that's just the way they set it up. And so the younger knew he wasn't going to get as much as the older, but what he was going to get, he wanted it. Church, for someone to hear the gospel and to say thanks but no thanks, but then take advantage, if you will, of all that the world has to offer, it's the same thing. You know, God, I'm thrilled that you gave all this to me, but this is all I want. I don't want anything to do with you. Now, they would never say that with their mouth, most likely. They might not even have that realization that God created all of them. But you need to know that our Father in Heaven feels that rejection. Our Father in Heaven feels, because it's Jesus explaining this. So you've got the declaration of the lost soul. 2 Corinthians, and you see this in your notes, 4, 1 through 4. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, and in, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. You've got to let your little light shine for the people in your workplace to see it. You cannot hide the gospel in your life. Proverbs 14, 12. There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Psalm 14, 1. The fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. Romans 3, 10, 12. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Church, one of the greatest statements to me is this statement. There is nothing inside of us that commends us to God. There just isn't. And as a result, we don't have any appetite as a lost person. We don't have any drive. We don't have any desire. But watch this. Hallelujah. You know what happens in this old world? They start to hurt. Something happens, whether it's health reversal, financial reversal, a relationship reversal. They start to hurt, and the Holy Spirit 
starts to draw, and they see you at their workplace. They see you in their neighborhood, and they start to get hungry for what you have, and they don't, and God brings them to him through our witness. Look at B, the debauchery of the lost soul, the pleasures of sin. That's one of my favorite verses. The pleasures of sin last, but for a season. When I was in college and started preaching, I came across that verse. And the first time that I read it, I thought, yeah, that makes all the sense in the world. But I realized that I needed to see that from the world's viewpoint. The pleasures of sin are good. You see, as a young preacher, I preached that all lost people were unhappy. That's not true. There's a lot of lost people that are more happy than you right now. Because the pleasures of sin last. And then it goes on. But for a season. And then when that season is done, when the high is done, when the career is over, when the fame is gone, when the relationship is gone, fill in the blank. Now the pain is there. And this guy, church, he, he didn't even know to say it this way. He was living high on the hog. Yeah, a Jewish person would never say that. But he was living high on the hog until all of the money was gone. He forfeited his responsibility. He selfishly gathered his father's fortune. He lived it up. He lost it on riotous living. And then you see there and see the discoveries of the lost soul. So now he spent it. It's gone. What is he going to do now? Well, it's pretty clear what he's going to do now. He's going to hurt. He's going to suffer. Verse 14, life and its circumstances are in someone else's control. God. God is in control. The timing usually has a point to it. It just so happened that when he ran out of money, that particular area ran out of good weather. And as a result, they ran out of good crops. And as a result, they ran out of food. And as a result, the young man that didn't have a support system in that land, who didn't have a family in that land, he became destitute. Verse 15, our efforts, oh, wait a minute, circumstances can teach us lessons that we ignored earlier. Our efforts to fix our predicaments usually make it worse. Feeding swine. You and I cannot imagine the repulsiveness that this sent through the crowd when Jesus was talking. There were audible gasps when Jesus said that this Jewish young man filled his belly with the husks of the swine. <gasps> what he did. Look at verse 16. His need brought about by his sin made him destitute. No man gave unto him. Verse 17. His only hope was the very person he offended most. His father. Now I want you to think about this just for a moment. This young man is sitting on his bottom in the pig pen. He's eating the same thing that the pigs are eating. And the Bible says he came to himself. You know how they do in the movies and such? They pan around and they go, hmm. That, he had that experience. The person that he offended most was his only hope out of this. Church, for every lost person that says, I don't believe in God. I don't believe God created. I don't believe I'm here because of God. I don't believe God had anything to do with this. As Christians, we got to be okay with them saying that. Because they're not saying that because they know. They're saying that because they want that to be true. They're saying that because someone, quote, unquote, smarter than them, told them that. They're saying it because they don't know any better. And you and I have to have patience and love and grace and mercy for that. Because when the consequences of the circumstantial choices that they've made come calling, guess what happens? They realize the person that they've offended the most may be their only way out. And that's absolutely true. 
So look at verse 18 and 19. He embraced true repentance. What, what is true repentance? You're going this way, and you change your mind. You go this way. Now, I have shared with you guys my little situation with uh, my brooder at other times, and it's got a door that will only go so far up. And if I don't put that door with some kind of catch and I forget because I'm in a hurry, guess what happens? I cannot tell you how many times I've been hit on the head because I just I just lose track and I, and I forget and, and I, I have changed my mind. I have repented and I have figured out a way to keep that from happening. And I don't get hit in the head anymore. Praise the Lord. Now, just the other day on my tractor, I got a little uh, thing that, that, that can either go this way or can go up, and it, it's what's supposed to stay up to keep the tractor from rolling over and killing the person driving the tractor. Well, I don't have the little screws in there, so it was down like this, and I was working on something, and guess what I did? I raised up really fast, and I'm pretty sure I gave myself a concussion <laughs> because I saw stars. Now, I don't know if you've ever been hit like that in the head where things go fuzzy. Well, I went fuzzy. You know what I did? I laughed because God was trying to get my attention, <laughs> and he got it. You know what I did? I pushed that thing up. I got it out of the way. I changed my mind. Church, lost people need to change their mind that their way of thinking about their situation is okay. Their way of thinking about their lost condition is no longer okay. They need to repent. He changed his mind. He was humble. He was willing to accept a lower status. And then D, the determination of the lost soul, he arose. He followed through. When someone gets sick and tired of being sick and tired, they're going to follow through on repentance. He did not ignore the lessons this time. E, the delight of the father. The father was watching. Isn't that great? The Father was watching. Every person that you're praying for to be saved, God is diligent watching. He wants them to come to him. The Father was forgiving and restored him to sonship and fellowship. He rejoiced. You will find no different response from your heavenly Father. Now, most likely, every person here today has a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. If you do not, in just a few moments, we're going to have an invitation, and we're inviting you to come. If you'll come, I'll send you with someone gender appropriate. They'll share the gospel with you. But watch this. Maybe you are saved, but you've been out, and you need to come back home. You're not lost. You're just a prodigal. You have been doing your own thing. Today would be a great day to restore that relationship. Act 3, the disobedient soul winner. This was the other brother, the attitude of the disobedient soul winner. He was furious. Church, you'll know you're not in a right relationship with God when you're not excited when people come to Christ. You are not in a right relationship with God when you're not excited about great things happening for the kingdom. He was furious. The attention of the disobedient soul winner was on himself, and that's what always leads to that. He stressed his service and loyalty. He whined of there being no party for him. The focus of the disobedient soul winner was on himself. He cared more for the lost money than he did for the found son. Church, if you and I will spend some time asking the Lord to break our heart for lost people, he will do just that. He will break your heart for lost people. So you have the disobedient soul winner continued the redirection of the father. You know, what, you know what dad said? Son, everything I have is yours. Your brother already took his. He's not getting that money back. But he is getting his sonship back. And you ought to be thankful for that. The brother revealed his true struggle in selfishness. It was meet, fitting, appropriate. He was lost and was found. Now, as you see, we got done with this because I stuck with what was on here. 
I want you now to read with me. Which one are you? Committal prayer for the soul winner. Father, thank you for saving me and using me in your service. Please make me mindful of your commissioning and your empowering to carry out the commission for the saving of the lost in my world. Amen. The committal prayer for the lost soul. Dear Father, I have sinned against you in my thoughts, actions, and deeds. I know I deserve eternal punishment for these sins. I also know your son, Jesus Christ, died on the cross for my sins so I could have a son or daughter relationship with you. Please forgive me and restore me to a right relationship with you. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We call that the sinner, sinner's prayer, committal prayer of the disobedient soul winner. So this is a person that is saved, but they're not in a right relationship with God. Forgive me, Father, of my selfishness of taking advantage of the new life you gave me. You set me free so I could be a part of setting others free. Therefore, I'm asking for your empowerment to do just that. Make me an obedient soul winner. If you and I do not go throughout our day looking for opportunities to witness for Christ, we are not an obedient soul winner. And God wants us to be. Every one of us can be. You might say, but Brother Ben, I'm not sure what I got to do. That prayer right there will get it started. That prayer will get it started. And tomorrow morning, you start looking for opportunities. You look for doors to walk through. So Dale, Carol, and I were standing Friday evening at a restaurant waiting for our opportunity to go in. And I've got BMA Missions and Pastor at Bethel Baptist Church on my shirt. There's a guy waiting for his food. And he wanted to talk. But it was kind of funny because he just kept zeroing in on those words. Y you could tell he was trying to figure out who is this guy and is he safe to talk to? Is he going to try to win me to Christ right here? You know, you could tell. There was a little bit of apprehension. So all I'm going to tell you is Cracker Barrel was out of everything that night. It was almost, well, it was 930. They were out of dumplings. That should be against the law. They were out of macaroni and cheese. The, hey, at Cracker Barrel, those two things are vegetables. It's listed under the vegetables. I'm just eating my vegetables, folks. I don't know what to tell you. Uh, yeah, you can hate on me if you no. They were out of the special, which was fried cod. They were out of fried chicken. The list that she read to us when we got to our seat of what they were out of was longer than the list of the menu. <laughs> it's crazy. So they had gotten this guy's food already. And that's when they told him, I'm sorry we don't have any dumplings. And he just looked at him. That's the only thing my wife wanted. And we didn't really understand the urgency there. And... They said, well, we got all of yours. He's like, that don't help me at all. And you could tell he wanted to say, you don't know my wife. You could tell that's what he wanted to say. He didn't say it. And in she comes. And she's got a cane. She taps him. She says, let's go. And he's like, I, I've already paid for the food. Let's go. And he's like, what? And she's like, leave it. And that's when he said, it's going to be a great trip to St. Louis. <laughs> I told him, I'll pray for you. Church, now watch this. You and the Holy Spirit will have to determine how far he wants you to go in each one of those cases. And, and I can tell you, you'll win some and you lose some. But what I'm asking you to do is just be willing. And while me and Dale were listening to this guy, I was asking the Lord, show me an opening. Show me an opening. What, what, what do you want me to say? What do you want me to do? And I, I was about to encourage him to go on Bethelondale.com because I do that a lot anymore. You know, folks, that's an easy soul winner. If you want to know what Bethel's all about, go on Bethelondale.com and watch the messages. Watch, listen to the BRHs or go on YouTube and or look up Brother Ben's five-minute pastor, whatever the case may be. That's a easy, because everybody Googles stuff now. And I say everybody, you know what I mean. Se second service. Thank you for laughing. But my point is, is that there, if, if you and I are willing, there's a way to do it. And we've just got to be willing. Let's all stand, musicians, will you come?
one of the greatest ways to assure that in a hundred years from now, if the Lord tarries his coming, that Bethel Baptist Church is still having homecoming services is to win our community to Christ. That, that's, that's really the only way that I know to make sure that we're still going. Now, first service, folks, and I, I'm not talking about any of you, but somebody you know, okay? If we're not careful, we're bad to talk about this age group. Well, those young kids are so... Now, I know. I'm serious. I don't believe you guys do that, but you, you know it happens. If we will win their moms and dads to Christ, if we will win their grandmas and grandpas to Christ, they'll follow. I believe that. I believe that with all my heart. And if you see one of them light up and go for it, follow them. Follow them. And, and I, I don't care where revival comes from. It just needs to come. Amen. So, what's the Holy Spirit telling you today? Will you come? Brother David, will you receive?